Well, this is that time of the year, and we're probably past it now, where everyone is graduating. We have high school graduations, junior high graduations, some, some preschools have graduations, there's homeschool graduation groups, private school graduation groups, everyone's graduating. And this is one of those things in our culture where ceremonially we, we place a lot of emphasis on this. And there's some strange things. If, in fact, if we sit back and kind of look at what we do during graduations, it, it might come across as a little odd. We don't think they're odd because it's normal for us. But think about this. If I'm about to graduate from high school, and what do I need to do? I need to buy a black robe. What am I, a Supreme Court justice? I got to buy this black robe, which is strange because it's late June, early, early, or late May, early June, and it's hot outside. And so I'm going to go sit outside for two hours in a black robe. But on top of that, we have these hats. And what's the deal with these hats? Number one is they don't stay on. Okay, they have this little wraparound thing, and then there's this square thing on the top, and then there's a tassel, and I'm sure there's some history behind it, but this is one of those things that we, we, we celebrate this, but do we even really know what this is all about? You know, all human cultures throughout all of history have had ceremonies, and the reason we have ceremonies is that we usually will, will celebrate something that has occurred or we will remember something that has happened. And all cultures do this. And in fact, if we look at the Old Testament, we find very often that the Lord commanded these celebrations. There was Passover, there was the Feast of Booths, there was, there was all these different parties and celebrations and ceremonies. But as we move into the New Testament, we're going to find that Jesus himself has instructed us to have two ceremonies. Now, it doesn't mean we can't have others. But he has commanded us as his assembly that we are to have two ceremonies that should be normal in the practice and the function of his church. So our topic has been, I will build my church. And we discovered very early on that Jesus is the head of the church and we are his workers, but he's the boss. We also found that the word church comes from the Greek word ekklesia, and it just means an assembly or a gathering. And this was a non-religious word. It was a regular word. And so Jesus said, I will build my assembly. And we also learned from the book of Hebrews that we're not supposed to give up meeting together, that we're supposed to regularly gather with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we also found out that, and we know this from human observation, that whenever you have a, a horde of people come together, there's got to be some organization. How do, we, how do we guide this mob? And so throughout the scripture, we find that he has instituted government, that we have uh, we have elders and overseers, what we might call pastors. There are directors or deacons. There's different positions and different structures with checks and balances within his assembly. So today, we're going to examine one of what we might call the ordinances. Now, Jesus is the chief architect of this assembly, and he has ordered us to practice certain ceremonies with regularity within his assembly. Now, we believe there are two of them. That is the Lord's Supper and baptism. You probably can guess what we're going to be talking about today, the Lord's Supper. Now, in this arena, there are many religious terms thrown around. We hear things like sacraments and Eucharist and ordinances and holy orders and liturgy, and there's all kinds of terminology, and it can be kind of confusing. And so let's look at this idea of ordinances versus sacraments. You see, a sacrament is generally an event that is said to distribute grace. And so some churches have what they call sacraments, and this would be the Roman Catholic Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, some Methodists, some Presbyterians, and they believe that there are these ordinance or these sacraments, and that when you come together and partake of the sacraments, grace is distributed to you. Now, we use the term ordinance because we basically believe that these are ceremonies that symbolize or honors a reality. And so Protestants generally accept two, two ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper. And so let's move on to the principle of exactness because someone might say, well, you know, nobody agrees about all this stuff. 
Um, everyone's got their own view. This church does it this way, and this church does it that way, and everyone has their own view, and so no one agrees, and who cares? Well, my thought is we should care, and regardless of what other churches are doing, we have a responsibility to look to the text and ask the question, what does God want us to do apart from any other practice? And in fact, the scripture itself testifies that we ought to care. Now, this verse should give us pause. When Moses had finished speaking all these words to all Israel, he said to them, Take to heart all the words by which I am warning you today, that you may command them to your children, that they may be careful to do all the words of this law. Now, notice, he says you need to be careful to do all of it. And it's the same standard. We want to go before the Lord and say, Lord, we, we agree that you have called us to do this, but we want to be careful. And we want to study the scripture and ask the questions, how should we do this according to your word? Not our practice, not our heritage, not what other people are doing, your word. And then he goes on to say, for it is no empty word for you, but your very life. And by this word, you shall live long in the land. And so doing the scripture comes with a promise of living long and living at peace. And so Moses instructs us that we must be careful, very careful to do what's written. And we find this. We find that Nadab and Abihu offered unauthorized fire. They, they did something that was breaching the, the way you were supposed to do offerings, and they burned up and died. We, we read of Uzzah who, who put his hand on the side of the ark, and he was struck dead because he wasn't supposed to touch it. He wasn't a priest. And notice that even his heart was in the right place. He was trying to do what is right, and yet it was wrong. So there is an exactness to the Lord's commands. And Moses said we ought to be careful. And so this matters to us because we want to do exactly what the Lord commands us to do when it comes to the Lord's Supper. And so let's look at the Lord's Supper. Let's begin with some terminology. Um, you may have heard the word Eucharist before. Uh, you is a prefix meaning good. Charis means uh, grace. And so some people call it the Eucharist because they believe that this event distributes grace. Others will refer to it as communion. Now, uh, Protestants have generally referred to it as the Lord's Supper. And the reason is we don't believe that grace is distributed through this practice. So we don't use the word Eucharist, and communion might be a little too strong. So we just call it the Lord's Supper. And notice that the terms are typically based upon the believed function. So if you believe, like some churches do, that grace is distributed when you partake, then it would make sense to call it the Eucharist because it means good grace. But if what we're doing is, is commemorative, then it makes more sense to call it the Lord's Supper. Regardless of the terminology, uh, this practice actually had its origins in the Passover. You see, in Exodus 12, the final plague was about to fall upon the Egyptian people. And the Israelites were instructed to slaughter a lamb, to take a hyssop branch, and to wipe the blood on the mantle so that when the angel of death came to the house, he would see the blood and it would pass over the house. That's why we have the, the word Passover. Furthermore, the children of Israel were instructed, you guys have to be ready to leave. I want your stuff packed, your shoes on, your staff in your hands. Get ready to leave tonight. And they were specifically instructed not to use yeast in their bread. Now, typically, we just go to the store and buy our bread, and we don't really know a lot about bread. And so probably, I would say the average guy doesn't even know what that even means. What do you mean bread without yeast? That sounds kind of gross. Well, yeast is what makes the bread fluffy. It, it, it rises because of the yeast. And if it weren't in there, it would be flatbread. It would be like a tortilla or a cracker. Now, yeast, uh, to work its way through the bread, can take time. And there's many types of bread. But, but you, some breads, you, you might have up to three rises where the yeast is in there and it rises. And then it has to rise a second time and a third time. And this can take hours. So the idea was, you guys have to be ready now. You're going to need food, so bake bread without yeast so you can leave immediately. 
Now, this would later become a practice for the Israelites. Exodus chapter 12 says this, You shall observe this rite. Okay, there's that word. This was, a, this was a ceremony. This was something they were supposed to practice. You shall observe this rite as a statute for you and your sons forever. And when you come to the land, the Lord will give you as he has promised, you shall keep this service. That is, they were to celebrate Passover, and they were to partake of bread without yeast to remind them of when they fled. And so every year, the Israelites would do this, and they would bake unleavened bread. And it was during this very Passover meal that the Israelites practiced every year that Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. So let's look to the scripture and see what Jesus said. The Lord's Supper is recorded in three of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now, the event of the Lord's Supper is in John, but he doesn't mention the actual elements themselves. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to ask you if you would open up your Bibles to Matthew 26. We're going to be in Matthew 26, and we're going to read verses 26 to 29. So this is one of the three Gospels that gives us a direct instruction, and a direct observation of what Jesus would have us do. We're in Matthew 26, starting with verse 26, reading from the ESV. This is what it says. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took the bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples. And said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink of it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Okay, now if you want to stay there in Matthew 26, I want to go through this. If you notice, verse 26, it says they were eating. Well, what were they eating? They were eating the Passover meal. And please notice that this was a meal. This wasn't we gathered together and then, you know, there's like someone had a little cracker. It's like here's a little tiny cracker and then this microscopic cup with the peel out. There. Like, no, no, this was actually a meal. They were gathered for a meal. And in verse 26, it says Jesus blessed the food. And this is where we get the idea of, of blessing the food. Now, you might argue, well, was Jesus blessing the food, meaning we should bless every meal, or was he blessing the food he was about to give out for the Lord's Supper? Hard to say. But it specifically says in verse 26 that Jesus broke the bread. Now, once again, I ask the question because we don't always know, did Jesus break it because it was symbolic of his body being broken? Or did he break it because this was just incidental, that there's, you know, 12 other guys, and so he's breaking the bread to hand it out? We don't really know. So he passes out this bread, and then in verse 26, he says, this is my body. And one of the core issues with the Lord's Supper is, is this symbolic? Is this bread symbolizing his body, or is this actually his body? And we'll get to that later. Verse 28 he refers to this as the blood of the covenant, and all covenants, by the way, are sealed with blood. Every covenant that the Lord makes is sealed with blood. From the very beginning, when Adam and Eve sinned, and then the Lord had to clothe them for the first time, animals had to die so that they could have clothing. And then we go on and on and on from, from the, the covenant of circumcision all the way up to the sacrifice on the cross. Every covenant has blood attached to it. Because we know that without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin. Luke's version refers to this as a new covenant. Now, remember, a covenant was just an agreement or a contract. And so the Lord is letting his disciples know, and he's letting us know, that we have lived under the agreement of the Old Testament. But as the writer of Hebrews says, that's passing away, and it's going to be obsolete. And we're establishing a new agreement here. Verse 28 he says that this is poured out for many, for those who follow Christ. And then in verse 28, it also re refers to the forgiveness of sins. Now, notice it's not the supper that, that uh, equals the forgiveness of sins. It was the spilling of the blood. 
Luke adds something different in Luke 22, 19 in the parallel story. Jesus says in the book of Luke, to do this in remembrance of me. So this is, this is what we have. This is the establishment of the Lord's Supper. And as we've unpacked this passage, there are two points of application that I want to bring up right now. The first one is, is the purpose of the Lord's Supper, and it comes down to this. You might ask the question, why do we celebrate the Lord's Supper? Why do we do it? And the first reason is to remember Jesus and what he did. Remember, this is all about him. He says, do this in remembrance of me. But within this celebration, we have the bread representing the body and the fruit of the vine representing the blood. And so we we gather together to remember Jesus and what he did. And so this is one of the primary purposes why we celebrate the Lord's Supper. And the next thing is to celebrate this new covenant, that we had an old agreement and now we're under a new agreement. So this is it. This is, these are some of the purposes why we celebrate this Lord's Supper. Now, what I want to do is I want to move on to our next passage. Because this event would have taken place in around 30, 33 AD. We don't really know. But some 20 years later, Paul writes a letter. And he gives us some further instruction. And so, and and the instruction really has more to do with practice. So I'm going to ask you if you'd open up your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 11. So if you're in Matthew, just scoot forward. 1 Corinthians 11. Now to give you some background, uh, this... This was a church that that Paul was ministering to, and he had exchanged several letters. In fact, 1 Corinthians is actually the second letter. We know that there were four of them. So they've they've been sending letters back and forth, and what we find is that this church in Corinth was particularly sinful and chaotic. This church was a mess, and much of this letter is actually a rebuke for their behavior. So let's read what it says. We're in 1 Corinthians 11, starting with verse 17. This is what Paul says. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part. For there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, broke it, and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever, therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat the bread and drink the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. And that is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judge ourselves truly, we would, but if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. About the other things, I will give you directions when I come. Okay. The first thing we see in verses 17 to 22 is that the church's practice of the Lord's Supper was utter chaos. Paul says you actually make things worse when you come together, and you think you're eating the Lord's Supper, but you actually aren't, because what you're doing is such an abomination that it's not actually the Lord's Supper. 
You see, in this church, there were multiple divisions and factions. Uh, groups within the church were lining up behind certain leaders. We know that there were racial divisions. There were all kinds of divisions, even between the rich and poor. And so some people would show up, and they were very poor and some people were rich, and they had their own bread, and they're just eating their own bread. Oh, sorry, you should have brought some. And some people are eating first. Some people are like, hey, everybody, there's free wine at the church. And they're showing up, and they're drinking so much wine, they're starting to get hammered. And, uh, you know, so it, and then others are showing up for free food. So this is, was, a, was a total mess. Paul says, verse 27, if you eat this the wrong way, you will bring judgment upon yourself. In fact, if we read on verse 30, he says that this judgment has caused some to get sick and even die. And this is why we have to be careful. Now, am I saying that the Lord is going to strike us down? No, I'm saying that when we gather together to partake of these elements that he has commanded, this is serious business. This is why we go back to the principle of exactness. This is the creator of the heavens and the earth, that consuming fire, and he tells us exactly how to make priestly garments, exactly how to construct the Ark of the Covenant, exactly how to offer various sacrifices, and he tells us exactly how to celebrate the Lord's Supper, and the church of Corinth was doing it wrong, and they fell under judgment. Now, Paul also adds something about the purpose of the Lord's Supper. He says in verse 26, that when we take this supper, we proclaim the Lord's death. With this ordinance, we are testifying as to what the Lord has done. You see, there may have been new people, non-believers, new believers who show up, and they come to the service, and they're like, what are you guys doing? Why do you have the bread and, 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 and the wine, and, and why are you breaking it, and what's the deal with the body? Like, what does all of this mean? And this question would have been an opportunity for someone to share this is what it means. And so Paul says, we proclaim the Lord's death. So as best as I can tell, based upon my study of the scripture, these are the three reasons we celebrate the Lord's Supper. We remember Jesus and what he did. We celebrate the new covenant and we proclaim his death. But based upon Paul's instruction, there are a few points of practice. This is the purpose, but let's look to the practice. Now, the first one is that the Lord's Supper is for Christians. Now, it doesn't state this specifically, but everything points to this idea that, that if you are in Christ, if you're part of this new covenant, then this is for you. And if you're not, it's not for you. So this is for Christians, and this is why we have to be careful as far as like, oh, the there's little kids, I, I want a piece of bread, I, I want, well, not right now. This is a time for Christians to come forward and partake. The practice of the Lord's Supper also invites judgment if done incorrectly. The practice of the Lord's Supper is not for free food. Now, we don't have an issue with this today because we have so much food, no one can ever really starve to death in our country. But in the ancient world, uh, the cost of your food was a large portion of your salary. And so there would be a rumor going around like, hey, did you hear about that, that new group? They, they follow some, some crucified guy. Oh, yeah, they're meeting over there in this building. Well, what's the big deal? Well, they're offering free bread. Really? You can get free food there? That's awesome. And so people would go just for the free food. The practice of the Lord's Supper should be done with self-reflection. Paul talks about this in the verse that we just read, that we ought to reflect upon our own lives. And so we come together and we might ask the question, do I need to repent of anything? Do I need to confess anything? Do I need to uh, offer forgiveness to someone? Uh, do I need to ask for forgiveness? Do I need to, you know, all of the, the things in our lives, am I being separated? Am I, am I saying, oh, um, I'm of this racial group and there's another racial group and I don't really like them. They can have their own look. Like all of this stuff, he tells us to reflect upon this. So this is a solemn event of reflection where we come together and we turn the mirror upon ourselves. But he also says it should be done with unity. Now, we don't necessarily have this problem today, but I would say 
around the world we do, and in our history in the past we have, where you have rich people and poor people, you have one ethnic group and another ethnic group, and they would say, you know what, we're not going to allow your group to partake in our Lord's Supper. You're one of those poor worker peons, and and we're upper class. You have your supper, we're going to have ours. We're Greeks, we're going to have our suppers. You're Jews, you have your supper, and Paul is not having any of it. Because under the banner of Christ, the only thing that matters is are you in Christ or are you outside of Christ, and that is the dividing line. Nothing else matters, and so it should be done with unity. Let's look at the issue of eligibility. And what I mean is, it's already clear that the Lord's Supper is for Christians only, but the question is, is how should this be enforced? And here we enter into a gray area where, where churches will, will vary, you know, depending upon the denomination, and some, some churches will practice what is called closed communion. And what this means is that the Lord's Supper would typically only be offered to verified members of the church. I don't know how common this is today, but it was more common back in the day. And so the idea would be, as a church, we vet our members. We know who's a Christian and we know who's not. And so we're going to come together. We're going to have the Lord's Supper. And if you're a guest or you're new, we love you, but this is only for our members. And so the members would come forward, and they would, enta- they would partake of the Lord's Supper, and it would, it would be a way to sort of shield anyone against taking it inappropriately. Now, the downside of this is that you might have legitimate Christians from other churches that are visiting, and they're passing through, and, or they're a member of another denomination, and they're denied the opportunity to partake. Now, this is the most careful way, but it's a way to also offend and exclude people. That's not the practice that we have here. Others practice what is called open communion, and this is what we do. This means that the church leadership does not verify eligibility, that we leave that on the individual. And so what we would say is this is for Christians, and if you wish to come forward and partake, then you may partake, but that is between you and the Lord. Now, the danger, of course, is that people may take it and bring judgment upon themselves, or maybe judgment might fall upon the church. But at the end of the day, I just feel like the the responsibility is between you and God, and who am I to judge? The other issue we face is one of frequency. And the question is, how often should we take the Lord's Supper? Now, this is difficult because the Scripture is not very clear. Now, the general Christian practice is to do it anywhere between once a week and once a month. But there are some denominations out there that do it every week, and they teach that you have to do it every week, and if you don't do it every week, you're in sin. Now, of course, people can do what they want, but I just don't see anything in the text suggesting that we have to do it every week. You see, if we do it too often, it becomes commonplace, and it's no longer a special celebration. And if it's done too infrequently, then we run the risk of being disobedient to what God has called us to do. Now, our church typically does it about 13 to 14 times a year. That is, we do it once a month, and then sometimes we do it additionally when around Christmas or Easter. And I feel like this is a good balance of of doing it regularly, but also not so often that it feels commonplace. And and some may disagree, and that's okay. But here's another thing that we know uh, as far as the practice is that the Lord's Supper uh, should be done regularly. Now, let's look at the nature of the elements, and this is a big one. The question is, what exactly are we eating here? Jesus said, this is my body, and he either meant this literally or he meant it figuratively, or maybe he was literally being figurative. I don't don't know. It's one of those. But as you may know, the Catholic Church takes Jesus' comments literally. They believe with the oversight of a priest, the bread and the wine turn into the body and the blood of Jesus, and this process is called transubstantiation. Now, there's a big word to learn right there. 
But this is a relatively new concept in the history of the world. There are vague statements made by uh, many of the early church fathers that seem to support this being the body of Christ, but Protestants would argue that their statements are figurative in the same way, so that when Jesus said, this is my body, and then early church fathers said, this is my body, they were following along with his metaphor. But in the sixth chapter of the 13th session of the Council of Trent, which took place in AD 1215, the concept of transubstantiation became official uh, Roman Catholic Church dogma. This is what it says. And because that Christ, our Redeemer, declared that which he offered under the species of bread to be truly his own body, therefore has it ever been a firm belief in the church of God. And this holy synod doth now declare it anew that by the consecration of the bread and of the wine, a conversion is made of the whole substance of the bread into the substance of the body of Christ our Lord and the whole substance of the wine into the substance of his blood, which conversion is by the Holy Catholic Church suitably and properly called transubstantiation. So this is in A.D. 1215. Now, because I like to cause trouble, and I, I, I'm certain I'm not the only one who's thought of this, but I always thought maybe we could do a scientific test. We could have someone go and take the bread and the wine, and then we'll pump the contents of the stomach, and we'll do a DNA analysis. Is this bread, or is this now human flesh? But the Catholic Church would respond to such a scientific inquiry that this is a, a mystery and cannot be verified by science. And in fact, many Roman Catholics would argue that this is not the literal body and blood, but there is a literal presence of the Lord in these elements. Now, please note, I am not picking on any church. I believe in religious freedom, so people can practice what they want, but I just want you to know what's being taught out there. And other groups take this view, like the Eastern Orthodox, the Greek Orthodox, and there are others. And so there is the view out there that this is literally the body and the blood of Jesus. Now, the other view is that Jesus was not being literal, and this was just symbolic. And we find this over the course of his ministry. He made many statements that were hyperbolic or symbolic. He said, I am the true vine. Well, I don't think Jesus had cell walls around his cell. He wasn't a plant. He says, I am the door. This is an analogy. He also says, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. This is hyperbole. So as Protestants, including our church, we believe that his statements surrounding the Lord's Supper are symbolic and that we are not eating his body, but we are eating food that symbolizes his body and his blood. And so we would argue, as far as the nature of the Lord's Supper, that it is symbolic. It's not Jesus's real body. Now, one of the final issues on the nature of the elements, we know that they're symbolic, but what does this event actually do? So when we come forward and we celebrate, and we know that we're commemorating and, memor and remembering the Lord, but, but does anything happen here spiritually? Is there, is there anything that goes on? Now, going back to the Roman Catholic Church, they call this a sacrament or a Eucharist because they believe that grace is dispersed through, the event, through this event. That if you come and partake, there is a measure of grace that is dispensed to you, and if you don't partake it, then you are denied some measure of grace. Now, this is why oftentimes you'll find different churches will deny communion. Now, it came out on the news recently that there was a, a church in San Francisco that denied Nancy Pelosi communion. Now, I'm not picking on her specifically. This was just in the news. So, But you see, if you believe that the Eucharist distributes grace to you, then you're going to want to go and take it as much as you can. And if the church denies it to you, then you are spiritually uh, deficient until you go and partake of it. But Protestants, including our church, we believe that this event, the taking of the Lord's Supper, is commemorative. We believe that God distributes grace to us, but that grace comes in the Holy Spirit that lives within us, and the grace isn't given to us through this event. So this is commemorative. So when we partake, 
I don't think there's any evidence of anything extra spiritual happening other than we are obeying the commands of the Lord. Now, one last thing. Let's look at the precision of practice. Because the Lord is very specific in His commands, we ought to take every effort to do the Lord's Supper as close to what is described as possible. And this raises some questions because some would immediately argue, Nathan, I've been here before and I've partaken of the Lord's Supper here at this church and you're not using real wine. And so if you're going to say that we have to do it as close to the Bible as possible, then why aren't you using real wine? And that's a fair question. First, I would say we don't know what the alcohol content of what was being served in the ancient world. We know that they had the ability to make grape juice, they had the ability to make table wine, low percentage alcohol wine, and they had the ability to make strong wine, and the same Greek word covers all of them. So we don't know how much alcohol was in there. So it could have been grape juice and it could have been table wine. Now a table wine is about maybe 10% alcohol content. So if you go to France and you see 10-year-olds drinking wine at dinner, this is what they're drinking. Uh, some stronger wines might be up to 14 or 15%. Dessert wines get higher. The point is that we don't really know what they were serving there. The other issue is that we never base our practice on a single verse. We take all of the Bible as a whole, and then we come up to a principle. And what we see in 1 Corinthians 8 and Romans 14, that we are taught specifically not to do anything that would cause a brother to stumble. And since there's so much, uh, so many lives have been destroyed by alcohol, and there, you'll have people that, oh, I've been, I've been sober for 20 years, and then they come, and they don't know, and then they drink, and it's actual alcohol, and we cause them to fall off the wagon after 20 years of sobriety. So based upon 1 Corinthians 8, Romans 14, and the knowledge that we don't know what percentage they were using, I'm very comfortable saying that it's okay for us to use just grape juice that is non-alcoholic. And, and, and how legalistic are we gonna, are we gonna get? We had, um, we had someone one time who went to the store to get us grape juice for our communion and they didn't realize they grabbed the wrong bottle and it was, it was grape apple, okay? And we just went ahead with it anyway. There was still grape in there, but there was a little bit of apple, okay? So we just went with it. Now, what about, what about areas where there's no bread and no wine? And, and this is a serious issue. Oh, okay, so you're, you're in World War II, and you're fighting in a foxhole, and you've been out in the field for months, and a group of Christians have gotten together, and they're praying together, and someone says, well, we ought to do the Lord's Supper. Well, we don't have any, we don't have any elements. Well, I've got this package of, of grape jelly in my MRE. So you squirt it into some water, you mix it up. Well, we don't have bread. All we have is leavened bread. We have regular bread. What I would argue is in a situation like that, you do your best. What about missionaries who, say, go to Southeast Asia? Maybe they're ministering among uh, the Hmong people, and there is no bread anywhere. Well, what are you going to do? Some may disagree, but I would argue you do your best. You get some rice cakes, you pack them down, celebrate the Lord's Supper. But if you can use the elements, then use it as close as possible. Now, one other question that has been raised, and this is one that I've thought of for a while, and I'm not so sure where I stand on this. Some would ask, well, Nathan, why don't we eat a real meal? Are we cheapening it by not actually having a meal? Some would argue that when Jesus ordained this event, they were at the Passover meal. It was a full meal. And then if you look at what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians 11, it sounds like people were actually eating food as in a meal. And so why don't we do it that way? And I thought about this for a long time, and I've always wondered, are, are, we, are we doing this wrong? Should we do it to where we have a service, and then we go up to the coffee house, and then we practice the Lord's Supper up there with a full meal? I don't know. The only reason I would argue that we're allowed to do it this way is Paul says in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty two. 22, he says, do you not ha have houses in which to eat and to drink? He makes a couple of statements in there that suggest that maybe this isn't really about the food. 
And so I think, based upon some, some comments that Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, uh, verse 22, and one near the end, he basically suggests that this isn't really about the eating. And so based upon that, I think we can do it without having a full meal. And so the final word is that we should practice this supper as precisely as possible. Just based upon the principle of exactness, of us doing exactly what the Lord wants us to do. Now, if we look back at 1 Corinthians 11, I don't think we're going to be struck down because, you know, there was like a tad bit of leaven in the bread and we didn't know about it. I don't, that's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about in this church is, is just the way they were treating each other, that they were ununified, that the rich and the poor and the Jews and the Gentiles, it was just a big mess. But I would say, let's just be as precise as possible.